The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Mapping a New Treatment Journey in NF1, New Developments with MEK Inhibitors for Pediatric and Adult Patients with NF1 Plexiform Neurofibromas. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash DET860. Downloadable slides are also available. Good day. Uh, welcome to Mapping a New Treatment Journey in NF1, New Developments with MEK Inhibitors for Pediatric and Adult Patients with NF1 Plexiform Neurofibromas. My name is Christopher Mortel. I'm director of the Comprehensive Neurofibromatosis Clinic at the University of Minnesota. Today, I will focus on developments with MEK inhibitor therapy in the setting of NF1 plexiform neurofibromas. We will discuss how recent evidence from major medical congresses may soon inform how we manage adult and pediatric patients with this condition. Let's begin. Neurofibromatosis type 1 uh, occurs with a frequency of about 1 in 2,500 people. It spares no race or nationality. It is a genetic neurocutaneous disorder, which is autosomal dominant, and it predisposes individuals to both benign and malignant tumors. Plexiform neurofibromas specifically afflict about 40 to 60% of all people with NF1. They're composed chiefly of Schwann cells that carry the NF1 mutation. These Schwann cells then recruit fibroblasts, infiltrating mast cells, and endothelial cells around bunches of nerves, creating the tumor, which is a, ple a pleomorphic cellular benign tumor but nevertheless difficult by nature. Disfigurement and motor dysfunction due to the infiltrative nature of these tumors can be very difficult for many patients to bear. They can be deep, nodular, and invisible. Symptoms may include pain, neurologic deficit, and mass effect on surrounding structures. They can be life-threatening mechanical compression of the trachea, the large blood vessels, or the spinal cord can, in, can occur in individual patients. Plexiform neurofibromas are felt to be congenital, but they may not be apparent in infancy and oftentimes won't appear until the second decade of life, even though they've been there the whole time. Growth most often occurs in young childhood, and certainly we've uh, we've documented that growth rates in young children are higher than adolescents and adults. To the present time, surgery has been the mainstay of treatment. Chemotherapy has been tried in the past, but is really not very effective. And radiation therapy should be avoided at all costs. Number one, the benefit is very unclear, but number two, and most importantly, the increased risk of secondary malignancy uh, should not be forgotten. Surgery, as I mentioned, does play an important management role in the current guidelines for plexiform neurofibroma management. Um, it is best for small and completely removable or resectable tumors. And of course, there are some cases where debulking of the tumor may be important to protect vital structures, uh, the eye in orbit, the airway. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of different surgical indications out there that should be carefully considered. However, challenges related to surgery include what we have listed here. The complication rate can uh, be up to a third of patients. Some may have worsening sensory symptoms, that is more pain, some may develop new or worsening motor deficits. And we've seen those especially uh, when people have surgery around their brachial plexus or the lumbosacral plexus. Um, they can definitely, we can definitely have patients who de develop forelimb weakness, grasp weakness, foot drop, 
uh, all kinds of different things. So that really needs to be kept in mind uh, before uh, surgeons become too adventurous. CSF leaks or pseudomeningocele can certainly happen in patients who are having surgery on paraspinal neurofibromas. Spine deformity has occurred post-surgery. And of course, uh, as in all surgeries, wound infection is an important complication that should be considered. Prior evidence has shown that 46% of patients had tumor progression after surgery, and this is certainly the case. 20% of patients had repeat surgery due to plexiform neurofibroma compression or progression, excuse me, in the past. NF1 is caused by a mutation in the neurofibroma gene. NF1 is a tumor suppressor gene. Loss of neurofibromin results in overactivation of growth signaling pathways. Mitogen activated protein kinase uh, is a key downstream component of the RAS signaling cascade. Inhibition of MEK results in the suppression of this overactive RAS signaling. Listed here are the major MEK inhibitors that are used for NF1 plexiform neurofibroma. Selumetinib has been approved for pediatric patients aged 2 to 18 years who have an NF1 with a symptomatic inoperable plexiform neurofibroma. Mertametinib has an ongoing phase 2b trial, which uh, the, the main phase of which has been recently completed. The uh, new drug application for this agent was uh, submitted in March of 2024, and uh, further um, evidence was uh, provided to the FDA in June of 2024. Trametinib has a completed phase 2 trial but it's only approved uh, for unresectable or metastatic malignant melanoma or patients with V600E tumors, specifically children with V600E mutant low-grade glioma in combination with dibrafenib. And finally, binimetinib has phase two adult and pediatric studies, which are ongoing, um, and those results are still some time away. Our goals for today, first, are to enhance your understanding of the latest evidence supporting modern and emerging MEK inhibitor therapy in NF1 plexiform neurofibromas. Second, I would like to strengthen your ability to develop evidence-based treatment plans that include MEK inhibitors for pediatric and adult patients with NF1 plexiform neurofibroma. And finally, I hope to equip you with techniques for managing practical care delivery, uh, considering MEK inhibitors, including dosing, monitoring, and management of adverse effects uh, or toxicity. What is the current progress with MEK inhibitors in pediatric and adult patients with NF1PNs? Well, the most important trial to date uh, was the SPRINT trial. The SPRINT trial uh, studied selumetinib in pediatric NF1 plexiform neurofibroma. This phase two trial led to the FDA approval of selumetinib in 2020 for patients between the ages of two and 18 with NF1-related symptomatic inoperable plexiform neurofibromas. The dose was 25 milligrams per meter squared given twice daily. And the dosing is continuous. That is, there's 28 day cycles, but it, uh, you never have a break. It just continues on and on. If, if there are no DLTs and no progressive disease, patients can, could continue on this trial for up to two years. The primary endpoint was described by 3D analysis of MRI of the plexiform neurofibroma. That 3D analysis provided a plexiform neurofibroma volume measurement, greater than 20% decrease um, in uh, tumor volume 
is now used as a standard throughout uh, the NF community to show effectiveness of therapies with plexiform neurofibromas. The sec secondary endpoint looked at tumor-specific functional parameters, patient-reported outcomes, tolerability, PK, PD, and safety. Longer-term evidence shows consistency of clinical benefit with selumetinib uh, in this treatment group. Looking at 74 children with NF1PN with up to five years of selumetinib treatment, the overall PR was 70%. The, this showed durable tumor shrinkage, sustained improvement in pain beyond results previously reported at one year, no new safety signals, that is no new toxicity, and monitoring throughout treatment was judged to still be necessary since some toxicities could still emerge. Nevertheless, if you compare uh, uh, selumetinib therapy to the natural history of plexiform neurofibromas, uh, the pr progression-free survival probability was quite favorable. Longer-term response uh, data also included median time to initial response. And the median time to initial response in this patient group was eight cycles or approximately eight months. Some people had their initial response that is greater than 20% shrinkage in as little as four months, while some took 40 months or over three years. The median time to best response was 18 cycles or a year and a half. And again, the range was from four months to 94 months. The median duration of the first confirmed PR was 34.5 cycles. And again, here are the most common adverse uh, events uh, in, with selumetinib, especially in the long term. Uh, number one, vomiting, which is somewhat unique in this, uh, with this drug, diarrhea, and finally, nausea. So GI effects are important with selumetinib. Skin effects are also very important in this uh, whole MEK inhibitor group. Acneiform rash uh, happens in nearly half of all patients. And perinicchia in this treatment group happened in half of all patients also. And those can be really um, nasty things to deal with if you fall behind. I, uh, we also note that you can have an increased creatine phosphokinase or CK in, in this patient group. And you see that about three quarters of patients on the SPRINT trial um, did have an increased CK. Um, there's uh, some discussion about just how important that is these days, but you'll notice that about 8% of all uh, participants did have a uh, grade three or greater CK, um, and that it implies that there was muscle weakness, aches, uh, or pain accompanying the CK increase. Dose reductions occurred in about 39% of patients due to selumetinib-related adverse events. 42% of uh, participants, or about half, discontinued therapy. Many patients have a difficult time with a twice a day drug, um, including, uh, and I, I call this treatment weariness. Um, and I've had a number of patients uh, go off of their medication for that reason. There is some evidence uh, with selumetinib in adults with NF1 associated plexiform neurofibroma. And there is an ongoing phase two study of selumetinib, again, uh, uh, 50 milligrams per dose, not given on a weight or uh, surface area based uh, regimen. Um, and that's given uh, twice daily in adults with NF1 plexiform neurofibroma. Again, these are continuous 28 day cycles with no breaks. Um, and um, there, there is efficacy data, including 16 out of 27 patients who have had a partial response. Patients reported significant improvements in pain, which is the main signal in a lot of these MEK inhibitor trials. 
and the median change in plexiform neurofibroma volume at best response so far was about a reduction of 22%. Again, the most common side effects were rash, a transaminitis and pancreatic enzyme elevation. Two patients required dose reduction due to rash or transaminitis. Two, again, discontinued by choice. Two were with withdrawn by the principal investigator, and one patient each was removed for transaminitis, surgical resection that was deemed more important at the time, serious concurrent medical illness, which we often have to deal with in adults, and finally, non-compliance with the twice-a-day regimen. We're done with selumetinib, and now we're going to talk about mirtametinib, the new boy on the block. It is an uh, we recently uh, completed the RENEW trial. Uh, the RENEW trial is an open-label, pivotal phase 2b trial of mirtametinib in both adults and children with NF1-associated plexiform neurofibroma. Patients aged two or more uh, with inoperable NF1 plexiform neurofibroma causing significant morbidity were enrolled on the trial. We uh, enrolled 58 adults and 56 pediatric patients. Mirtametinib was either given as a capsule or a dispersible tablet. Um, and the dose was two milligrams per meter squared twice daily, the maximum four milligrams uh, PO twice daily. The schedule was interesting. It was given uh, three weeks on one week off. Um, and the purpose of that was to give people a kind of rest in between to see if it would improve side effects. There was no fasting requirement, unlike uh, selumetinib and trametinib earlier. 24 cycles uh, were given, and one cycle was 28 days. That 28-day cycle, again, uh, was 21 days on, seven days off. There was a safety follow-up at the completion of, this, of the therapy of 30 days, and patients could opt for optional long-term follow-up and continuation of the drug. And again, whenever uh, long-term follow-up or long-term therapy was completed, uh, there was a safety follow-up 30 days later. Again, the primary endpoint was confirmed overall response rate, and again, we see that Tar target uh, reduction in tumor volume of more than 20%. Uh, that again is the standard now. Um, and again, that was measured by MRI. And in the case of this trial, we defined a confirmed overall response rate as that tumor volume reduction on two consecutive scans assessed by blinded independent central review. Key secondary endpoints included duration of response, help with pain, health-related quality of life measures, um, and of course, safety. Looking at the efficacy of mirtametinib in pediatric patients, 29 out of 56 patients achieved a greater than 20% reduction in plexiform neurofibroma volume. Median best change in plexiform volume was 42%. 52% had an, a confirmed objective response uh, that achieved an actually what we call a deep response, that is greater than 50% tumor volume reduction. We saw statistically significant improvements in pain, quality of life, and physical function measures. This is a waterfall plot showing the best percent change in tumor volume for each target plexiform neurofibroma and showing the cycle on the right, the cycle during which this was achieved. So you can see that some people um, achieved uh, a best tumor volume change very early after uh, cycle five to nine, while others took up to 40 cycles to achieve their best tumor response. In adults, we saw 
that 24 out of 58 patients achieved a greater than 20% reduction in plexiform uh, neurofibroma tumor volume. Two additional adults achieved a PR in long-term follow-up, that is after two years on therapy. Again, the median best change in plexiform neurofibroma volume was very similar to kids. It was about 41%. 62% of adults who achieved a confirmed objective response, again, achieved a deep response, that is greater than 50% tumor volume reduction. St statistically significant improvement in pain, quality of life, and physical function were again observed. And this is the waterfall plot for adults uh, displayed in the same way uh, uh, tumor best change in uh, tumor volume and the cycle during which that was achieved. And again, you see that some were very early and others were late. Mertimetinib demonstrated a manageable safety profile in both pediatric and adult patients. Um, again, the, um, the toxicities we saw were very similar to those seen with other MEK inhibitors. Diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, although not as frequent as, as seen with selumetinib, were present as major treatment-related adverse events. Many patients uh, exhibited fatigue, and not mentioned previously, but present in other MEK inhibitors, decrease in, in ejection fraction observed on cardiac echo, on cardiac, uh, echo uh, was observed in a number of patients. Only one child had a greater than uh, grade three decrease in ejection fraction. Uh, blood creatine phosphokinase increases again were seen and here we saw uh, patients with a greater than grade three CK uh, elevation. Interestingly, in, in this group of adults and children, paronychia were seen, but at a lower rate than was seen uh, with um, selumetinib and certainly uh, lower than my experience with trametinib. A serious treatment-related adverse event only happened in one patient. This was a young woman with a recent COVID infection who was on hormonal contraception. She developed a blood clot that affected her eye and she actually got a retinal venous occlusion. Um, uh, and that was resolving, but she's now lost, for follow lost to follow-up. Um, so this just underlines that even though this isn't uh, listed under our treatment-related ad adverse events. We should always keep in mind retinal uh, vascular events uh, in all patients with NF, but specifically those patients who are on MEK inhibitors. Uh, a, a low number of patients had interruptions due to their treatment-related adverse events, um, and some had dose reductions, which is common with this drug. So none, none of these numbers were really out of bounds um, and were generally favorable on this clinical trial. Um, paying specific attention to the dispersible tablet formulation uh, provided for the RENEW trial, we, say we see very minimal differences in PK and in safety comparisons. The dispersible tablet may be important for young children, but keep in mind that there are a number of patients with NF1 uh, who are on the autism spectrum and have some difficulty with swallowing. Others may have difficulty uh, with swallowing uh, due to increased gag reflex, other things like that. So the dispersible tablet formulation wasn't just uh, important for young children, it was also important for a, a number of older children, adolescents, and adults. Um, Trametinib, uh, again, has been used off-label um, and has been used for both adults and children uh, with NF1-associated plexiform neurofibroma. It's available in both a pill and a liquid formulation. 
Um, and currently, it's still recommended to be taken on an empty stomach once a day. The once a day dosing is certainly favorable for people who have compliance issues. Uh, the empty stomach uh, uh, dosing can be a challenge for some. So let's uh, prepare ourselves for personalized care with MEK inhibitors across the NF1 plexiform neurofibroma treatment journey. And I think one way to do that is to look at a young child with uh, NF1 at birth who's brought to the clinic with a symptomatic inoperable plexiform neurofibroma and compare that to how we would look at a 28-year-old male with NF1 who presents with a plexiform neurofibroma in the neck that is causing significant pain. Um, and as we look at these cases, we should look at what factors inform our treatment decisions. Is treatment with a MEK inhibitor the best option for these pediatric patients or adult patients for that matter? And how do you manage toxicities? That is keeping in mind uh, possible eye toxicity GI toxicity or skin toxicity? How do you address challenges such as difficulty swallowing that I brought up earlier? What is the current standard of care for adults? And what is the experience with adults on MEK inhibitor therapy? How will the approval of new MEK inhibitors impact treatment decisions and patient care? So first, I, uh, I think it's important to consider the size extent and, imp and, and the impression of progression of the tumor that, pa that, that young patients or parents will come in with. On the adult side, size, extent, and progression may be important, but it, it seems to me uh, that pain in adults is almost always the main complaint. Um, some adults have had long-standing plexiform neurofibromas, and some of those will cause disfigurement, uh, and that finally brings somebody in pursuing care. A functional deficit can result uh, from plexiform neurofibromas involving especially the hands, the feet, um, or uh, vital organs, and all those things need to be kept in mind. Um, and finally, looking at where the tumor is, considering impending morbidity is important. In a young child with a plexiform neurofibroma near the bladder, the kidneys, the airway, all those things should be kept in mind. And in adults, uh, I see over and over again, patients with the spinal variant of, uh, of NF1 who, who are at some concern for spinal cord compression. In addition, um, ma many patients have had prior uh, surgery, and we see uh, that the plexiform neurofibroma is progressing again. So we need to kind of keep in mind, how will we use these MEK inhibitors along with surgery in the future? In most cases, we should keep in mind in both adults and kids, stable tum tumors that are not causing morbidity or don't have the potential for significant morbidity may be observed. Many of these will never progress or cause symptoms, but as long as they're being observed both at home, by family and parents, and in your clinic, I think it's a very safe approach. Again, chemotherapy is really not to be considered in these patient groups, and radiotherapy, absolutely not. I've had to rescue patients uh, from radiotherapists in the past, and, um, and I've definitely encountered patients who uh, suffered malignancy as a result of radiotherapy to these lesions. So please, please, please stay away from that uh, unless you're in extreme, extreme circumstances. Surgery, should, again, should always be considered if you can do a resection without significant morbidity and without leaving significant tumor behind. Medical treatment uh, now has evolved to be a very significant part of management for these tumors. Selumetinib for pediatric patients with NF1 and off-label selumetinib for adults is very, very common now. Trametinib, again, is uh, available off-label 
and seems to be more available in Canada than anywhere else. Uh, but it's certainly available off label. And if you can get through insurance hoops, it's available for both adults and children uh, with NF1. And finally, mertametinib uh, and other MEK inhibitors are in rapid development and will be part of your, the armamentarium in the very near future. Volumetric MRI is one way of assessing treatment response, but not everybody has access to volumetric MRI. Most radiologists consider it a real time suck and really don't want to get into it. It affects their production. If you're at a community hospital or a, a academic hospital, it's very production oriented. Uh, so volumetric MRI is usually reserved for clinical trials. Patient reported outcomes have become more and more uh, important and using tools like promise to track changes in pain intensity and quality of life are very important. Um, and again, most adults and many children present with pain as their primary complaint. And so pain relief um, is, uh, is a laudable goal for anybody using MEK inhibitors to treat both adults and children with NF1. Finally, long-term monitoring, I've, I've shown you some of the, um, the toxicity uh, evidence and long-term monitoring is important uh, if you're going to be using MEK inhibitors for a prolonged period of time for sustained tumor control. Regular follow-up with a knowledgeable practitioner or a reliable community uh, practitioner who communicates well with the NF Center is really um, important to ensure continued efficacy and appropriate management of, uh, of any toxicity that might emerge. And again, just to reiterate, the toxicities to monitor include gastrointestinal toxicity. And uh, I've found that counseling people about an appropriate diet is important, uh, especially avoiding a lot of fatty foods or super spicy foods uh, really uh, reduces a lot of what we see as far as gastrointestinal toxicity. Skin toxicity can be managed with a really good anticipatory or prophylactic regimen. Most patients who are teenagers and above should be treated with doxycycline or a similar drug to prevent acneiform dermatitis. Um, and if we can keep pa patients on uh, a doxycycline-like drug for the first three months of therapy at least, then it really helps to prevent a lot of the dermatitis problems. In young children, a lot of the dermatitis is more eczematous in nature. And we found that bleach baths have been very, very helpful for uh, that patient group. And finally, hair changes. People Light-haired kids turn blonde, and my darker-haired patients frequently develop highlights. And that just means the drug is doing its job, and I've had a lot of teenagers love their hair changes. Um, again, uh, a close association uh, with a good dermatologist helps, uh, not a, a good ophthalmologist, I'm sorry, helps to um, stay on top of any possible eye toxicity, and a good relationship with your cardiologist for monitoring for ejection fraction changes is very important. Um, uh, and finally, CK evaluation and rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is super, super rare. Um, and CK elevations can generally be tolerated as long as they're not too high and as long as they're not causing the patient uh, other symptoms. Um, and uh, finally, headache is seen in many of our patients and is just part of management of NF1. Let's just talk about how we're going to manage these patients based on what I've already told you. This four-year-old girl, if, if she's got a symptomatic inoperable plexiform neurofibroma at present, the drug of choice is selumetinib, and we would counsel the patient regarding skin management, dietary management, and nausea management. And if we do that in a good anticipatory way and really stay close with the family, we're generally successful. The 28-year-old male patient who has significant neck pain, again, 
our hope would be that with appropriate anticipatory management, we'd minimize side effects, keep them on the drug, and hopefully uh, have relief of pain very early in his treatment. Um, and of course, that, that will be evaluated along with making sure that his spinal cord is safe um, and um, making sure that everything else in his neck is safe while we're monitoring his therapy. Um, and of course, uh, with approval of mertametinib in the offing, um, a single drug can be applied to both of these cases and can be used effectively. Um, in the four-year-old girl, I may choose mertametinib because there's a slightly lower GI toxicity profile that is less nausea and vomiting. But of course, uh, anticipatory care for skin is going to be important. Uh, in the 28-year-old male, we'll have our first approved MEK inhibitor for adults. Um, so we won't have to do a lot of off-label stuff and we'll have evidence-based um, uh, medicine that we can give to these uh, patients in the adult age group. So in summary, we have a number of MEK inhibitors. Selumetinib uh, is the chief uh, inhibitor on the market approved only for children. Mertametinib, we hope will be approved very soon. The um, toxicity of each is a little different with maybe more GI toxicity on the selumetinib side. Um, and again, just to underline what I said before, if you provide a good anticipatory management and careful um, monitoring for toxicity, you can keep patients on these drugs for a very long period of time um, with great success and hopefully improve their tumors and their symptoms over time. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for listening. Remember to download the slides and complete the post-test for instant credit. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. This activity is supported by an independent medical education grant from Springworks Therapeutics, Incorporated. To access all materials for this activity, visit peerview.com forward slash DET 860.